Hey there, my name is Salandrak, and welcome to the fourth installment in my Path of Exile guide for total beginners. These guides are for players who are completely new to Path of Exile, are coming back after a long hiatus, or who, for whatever reason, just never really got very far into the game. In the previous videos, I've covered topics ranging from understanding the passive skill tree, how to make your own build for completing the main story campaign, and ways to get unstuck if you hit a brick wall, as well as all sorts of important information regarding game mechanics. And today we're going to talk about what to do when you finish the campaign a time or two, and are ready to take the plunge into the deep end of the pool, the Endgame Atlas, which is where the real game of Path of Exile begins. As with all my guide videos, timestamps are down in the description, as are links to other resources you might find helpful, including several amazing Path of Exile content creators you should definitely check out. I'll also be keeping a pinned comment down below listing several beginner-friendly build guides you might want to try, which I'll keep updated for each new league as they come out. And as always, if you find this video helpful, informative, or at the very least somewhat entertaining, Please be sure to hit that like button and let me know down in the comments if there are any other beginner build guides I should include in my list. Now let's get to it! To kick things off, I want to discuss a topic I've only briefly mentioned in prior videos, which is Path of Exile's microtransactions, including how it relates to selling items to other players. Path of Exile is technically a free-to-play game, but the developers have to make money somehow, and they do so by selling a variety of items through their shop. The vast majority of these items are purely cosmetic, including appearance changes for your character, ways to spruce up your hideout, visual changes for various skills and effects, and even vanity pets that follow you around but don't actually do anything. The only functional items, though, are the various stash tabs that will significantly expand your stash's storage capacity as well as organizational capabilities. And if you end up getting very far into the endgame, you're going to quickly realize that you need at least a few of these purchased storage tabs, as there are a lot of things you're going to want to store and keep organized. Now the good news is that the stash tabs go on sale pretty regularly, and an in-game system message will let you know when there is a sale running. Also, purchased stash tabs are account-based, so whether you're playing in the Challenge League or Standard, Solo Self-Found or Hardcore, all purchased stash tabs will always be available for all of your characters. The bad news is that purchasing at least a few of these special stash tabs is pretty much mandatory if you're going to progress very far into the endgame. Because if you don't, you are going to run out of storage space and waste a lot of time trying to keep things organized. Call it pay to win or pay to play if you want, but that's just the way it is. Now of the various options available, there are three premium tabs that you'll definitely want to get, namely the currency tab, the map tab, and either a premium stash tab, an upgrade to premium stash tab, or a premium quad stash tab. None of these are really needed if you just want to play a character now and then through the campaign, but once you start plowing into endgame content, you're going to want to stockpile a lot of currency items, and the currency stash tab keeps it all nicely organized, while also allowing individual stack sizes to go up to 5,000, something you'll be hard pressed to exceed. As for the map tab, one of the first things you'll generally want to do in the endgame is work your way through the Atlas, which is the core of endgame content, using map items in your map device, which basically opens up individual zones similar to the zones you played through in the campaign. But given there are 16 tiers of maps, as well as unique and special maps with varying and shifting numbers of maps per tier, you are going to need a way to keep them stored and organized. As for the premium, upgrade to premium, or premium quad stash tabs, you're going to need to have at least one of these generic premium storage tabs if you want to list items publicly for sale, as the four basic stash tabs you get for free do not have this functionality. Oh, and don't even bother trying to sell items in any of the trade chat channels, as it's a waste of time and you'll probably just get ripped off. But once you do get a premium stash tab, you'll be able to set it to public, and then any items you place in it will show up on the trade website, which is the best way to sell the vast majority of items you're ever likely to see in your Path of Exile career. There are a lot of other stash tabs you may also want to consider as you get more experience in the game, or to suit your personal preferences. 
The divination stash tab can be nice as there are tons of divination cards you can end up getting and they can quickly fill up a regular stash tab depending on how much you play. I'm personally a big fan of the unique collection tab as even though most uniques are worthless, I still like to collect as many as I can during each league and use them for other characters. And the Essence and Fragment stash tabs are also really nice for keeping these types of items organized. The rest of the stash tabs generally tend to relate to specific mechanics from past challenge leagues, and if it's a mechanic you enjoy and end up doing a lot, then their related stash tabs might be worth getting, but otherwise you can probably just ignore them. For example, if you end up not caring for the delve mechanic, then there's really no need to get the delve stash tab. There is also a gem stash tab and a flask tab that I personally don't have and don't really see any reason to get, but if I'm missing something here, let me know down in the comments. Regardless of which or how many stash tabs you end up getting, there are a couple of tricks to keep your storage system a little more organized and effective. For starters, you'll want to make sure that you right-click on any special stash tabs you've purchased and make sure that their related affinities are active, as this will make it so that whenever you control click an item from your inventory, it will automatically get placed in the proper tab. And for items for which you don't have a special tab, it's not a bad idea to set up some of your generic tabs to be the default storage locations for various types of items. For example, I always have one of my tabs set for gems and flasks where I'll store any such items that have improved quality as selling such items having combined total quality of 40% will net you a gem cutter's prism or glass blower's bauble respectively, which can be useful in the early days of a league. As for selling items, to do that, you will need to set one of your premium tabs to public, and then you'll want to make sure that each item will be individually priced. When you place an item in this tab to be sold, you'll just need to right click on the item and then set the exact price, amount, and type of currency which will usually be Chaos Orbs, or if you find something really juicy, maybe Divine Orbs. That's all I want to say about stash tabs, so let's shift gears into trying to figure out how to actually determine which of your fat loot items might actually be worth selling. The best way to know if a given item is valuable, whether rare, unique, or otherwise, is to have vast in-game knowledge of popular builds, be up to date with the ever-shifting meta, and have a deep understanding of in-game crafting. But short of that, and particularly for new players, you're going to want a little tool that will help you quickly check whether a particular item might be worth trying to sell. And that tool is called Awakened PoE Trade. Now, there have been lots of different trade tools over the years, and there are a few other options currently available. And if this one ever becomes obsolete at some point, I'll let you know down in the description and or pinned comment but they all basically do the same thing, which is automate your ability to quickly search for similar items to see what price those similar items are currently listed for by other players on the trade website. Now before I go any further, I want to emphatically state that this tool is not against the terms of service of the game, as it is just adding an overlay that facilitates doing the same stuff you could do manually on the trade website. The link to download the tool is down in the video description. In order for the tool to function, you need to launch it before opening Path of Exile, and it will thereafter run in the background, and when you're in-game, all you need to do to price check an item is press Ctrl B when hovering over that item, and it will open an overlay with the mods of the item over which you are hovering. From there, you can pick as many or as few of the present mods, and then search to see what similar items are currently being sold for on the trade website, just as you could on the trade website itself. This is particularly useful for quickly checking whether unique items are worth selling, but it will take some practice and experience to determine whether rare or other items are worth actually trying to sell. Now, I'm not going to go into a detailed discussion about what sells, what doesn't, and how to really know whether your item is going to sell or not, as learning that stuff takes a lot of practice and experience. But here are a few general pointers. As a general rule, the vast majority of rare items randomly found while playing the game are not worth trying to sell on the trade website, unless they have specific combinations of high tier modifiers that players actually want. And the chances of that happening on a randomly dropped item are either astronomically low or common enough that the market is already flooded with similar items. 
Consequently, the vast majority of rare items you find while playing the game are going to be completely worthless. And if you use Awakened PoE Trade to search for similar items and think that, yeah, this item might be worth something, always remember that the fact that other people are listing similar items doesn't necessarily mean that they are in fact selling the similar items. In my personal experience, the vast majority of rare items I've put in my public stash tabs end up sitting there until the league ends or until they end up getting sold to a vendor. As I regularly go through the tabs and chop the prices in half or more and get rid of items that drop below whatever price I don't feel is worth my time even trying to sell to someone else, which can vary depending on how old the league is and how much currency I've already acquired. As for unique items, yes, there are a lot of uniques that if you're lucky enough to find them will definitely sell for a decent amount of currency. If you want to sell them quickly, it's a good idea to undercut the current market because again, listed items are the ones that are not currently getting sold and are just sitting there in people's public stashes. And pro tip, if you list an item for sale and shortly thereafter start getting spammed by all sorts of would-be buyers, chances are you mispriced the item and have listed it for far less than it is actually worth. So if that happens, take it out of your public tab, do some more research regarding the item in question, and then maybe list it again for a higher price. Now again, this is just a basic overview of selling items to other players, and as you get more knowledge and experience in the game, you'll get better at better at knowing what sells, what doesn't, and how to make currency in the trade economy. Well, let's shift gears now and talk about how to find and use good beginner-friendly build guides, which is what you're probably going to need to do if you ever want to experience all of what Path of Exile has to offer in terms of endgame content. As I mentioned in the last video, completing the main story campaign on your own without using any sort of a build guide is a pretty reasonable goal for the vast majority of gamers, and I actually enjoy doing that myself every now and then just for funsies. However, progressing through the end game is not something that most people will be able to do on their own unless or until they've followed several well-constructed build guides created by veteran players. And even trying to pattern a build off of other characters using websites like PoE Ninja is not likely to work well for new players in the end game, as it will be difficult if not impossible to figure out why these builds actually work much less emulate them with your own characters. Consequently, and whether you like it or not, the best way to really learn how to play Path of Exile is to follow a variety of well-constructed build guides that explain the hows and whys of what makes a build work, and bonus points if it includes crafting tips, leveling advice, and has multiple gear and gem loadouts and passive skill trees for varying character and item investment levels. I'm not going to mention any specific builds, guides, or build creators in the video because they do tend to come and go and builds regularly get nerfed or buffed or otherwise fall out of favor. But as I mentioned in the introduction, I will keep an updated list of beginner-friendly build guides for each new league down in the pinned comment. But beyond that, here are a couple of key pointers you'll need to understand if you want to go out and find beginner-friendly build guides on your own. For starters, in order to use pretty much any build guide these days, you're going to need to download and install an application called Path of Building. Like Awakened PoE Trade, this program is not against the terms of service of the game, as it is an entirely separate, standalone, open source, community created application that is essentially a character build simulator that lets you customize gear, skill gems, passive trees, and really accurately calculate how well your character will perform in a variety of in-game situations. It's also what every build creator worth following uses to not only build their own characters, but also to share their builds with others. Link for the application is down in the description. To find good beginner-friendly build guides, there are lots of places you might look, including the official game forums, where there are sub-forums not only for each class, but also each ascendancy for each class, as well as public forums like Path of Exile or Path of Exile Builds on Reddit, and popular content creators who stream on Twitch or post build guide videos on YouTube. Regardless of where you look, the key terms you're going to be looking for are builds that are self-described as some combination of beginner-friendly, league start builds, 
and bonus points if they are also viable for solo cell found. Let's talk a little bit about what each of these terms tends to mean within the community. Self-described beginner-friendly builds tend to be exactly that. Builds that are beginner-friendly in that they don't tend to involve complex mechanics, are easy to put together, and don't require particularly expensive or hard-to-get items to be effective. Now, the fact that a build is described as beginner-friendly doesn't necessarily mean that the build guide that goes along with it is beginner-friendly, as some build creators do a really good job of explaining the build at a level beginners can understand, while others maybe don't. But the general idea is that these builds should work pretty well regardless of the player's personal knowledge about the game. As for League Start builds, these are generally the sorts of builds that tend to do well without fancy, hard-to-get items, which is what every player faces in the beginning of a new league. These builds generally tend to be able to blast through the campaign and progress quickly to the top tier of endgame maps, but beyond that they may vary in terms of how well they perform versus different types of endgame content, such as taking down endgame pinnacle bosses, doing specific league mechanics, or quickly clearing top tier maps. Most good build creators will describe whether such builds are beginner friendly or not, but league start builds are generally safe bets when you're still pretty new to the game. And finally, any build should get extra bonus points for a new player if they are also solo self-found viable. As you may recall from my first guide in the series, solo self-found is a game mode that is truly a solo gameplay experience, where you are unable to trade with other players and gotta find all your gear completely on your own. Much like League Start builds, these builds will need to be able to perform adequately well without any hard-to-get items, and as such, they generally tend to be a bit more beginner friendly, though as with League Start builds made by good creators, they will ideally state whether they are beginner friendly or not. Whether the build guide you're planning to follow comes from a forum or reddit post, or has a YouTube video showcasing it, chances are somewhere in there will be a paste bin link, which is what you're going to use to import the build into Path of Building. To do so, copy the full URL of the paste bin link, and then within Path of Building, create a new blank build, click the Import Export Build button, and then paste the paste bin link towards the bottom of the build sharing area, and finally, click the Import button, and voila, you've imported the build. Now, every build creator does things a little bit differently. Some will have extensive information in the notes section, multiple passive skill trees to refer to while leveling, or even varying tiers of easier or harder to get items, and some won't. But as you play the game more and experiment using various build guides, you'll become better and better at filling in the gaps, and hands down, following build guides is the best way to learn what works well in the game. And as you become more familiar working with Path of Building, you will also be able to fine tune your own characters by importing them into the program allowing you to experiment with skill gems, passive skills, and even items to see how various tweaks can improve your damage output or survivability, all without actually changing anything on your character in the game itself. So now that you have a build that is well tailored for advancing through the end game, how do you do that? Well, buckle up as there's a lot of information to cover. Everything you've experienced so far while playing through the campaign is generally considered the introduction or prologue to the real game of Path of Exile, which only begins once a character has completed the campaign. And once you've done that, the first thing you're going to want to do is start fleshing out your atlas by completing maps. Map items begin dropping in the latter acts of the campaign, but can only be used once you've entered the epilogue, where right off the bat you'll be introduced to an NPC named Kirak. He will give you daily missions to complete randomly rolled maps, and also sells a variety of maps, the selection of which will restock each time you open one of his mission maps. Whether you're running maps from Kirak missions, maps you've purchased from Kirak, or maps you found elsewhere playing the game, your first goal in the endgame is to start completing the bonus objectives of these maps, which for low-level white maps of tiers 1 through 5, means defeat the boss when the map itself is at least magic rarity. For tiers 6 through 10 yellow maps, you'll need to defeat the map boss when the map is rare, and for top tier red maps of tiers 11 through 16, you'll need to defeat the map boss when the map is both rare and corrupted. Because surprise surprise, 
Just like almost everything else in Path of Exile, maps are items that can be crafted using various currency items. Most of the time you'll want to make all of your maps rare as the various map mods added to the maps will increase the map's item quantity, item rarity, and monster pack size, basically giving you bigger bang for your buck when running the maps. Do note though that some of these modifiers can make the map more difficult if not impossible for certain builds. For example, if you're using a skill that directly deals physical or elemental damage to enemies and try to run a map that has a modifier where enemies reflect a percentage of physical or elemental damage, you'll probably one-shot yourself against the first monster you try to kill. So pay attention to these map modifiers, and with time and experience you'll start to recognize which mods are dangerous in general, as well as dangerous or impossible for your build in particular. Completing the map bonus objectives will reward you with yet another type of skill point, because yep, you guessed it, there is also an Atlas passive skill tree. This tree is the same though for all characters and will be shared by all of your characters in the same league. First introduced in the 3.13 expansion and then overhauled in 3.17, I'm not going to say much about its specifics as it will likely continue to change and evolve going forward. But the basic idea of the Atlas passive tree is that it allows you to customize your endgame experience making it easier and more profitable to engage with content you want to engage with, while also allowing you to essentially turn off content that you don't want to mess with. So for example, if you decide that you don't like dealing with that creepy Tane guy, or that weird voice that taunts you when you run through that shimmery mirror thing, well, you can turn those mechanics off. When you're just starting out in the endgame, you'll most likely want to focus on taking nodes that increase your chances of getting more map drops, so you can complete more map bonus objectives, earn more Atlas passive points, and further expand your reach on the tree. Selecting nodes related to Kirak can also be very helpful early on, as you'll get more missions from him and be able to re-roll his available missions using scouting reports to hopefully get maps you haven't already completed or otherwise might be looking for. Once you're making good progress though on the Atlas, you'll then want to start branching off into other types of content, and on that front there are a ton of different Atlas passive strategies that might be used. When you're new to the game though, my recommendation would be to focus on a small number of mechanics at a time and try to really learn the ins and outs of those mechanics using the Atlas passive tree to maximize the benefits and effects of that type of content. Depending on how much you play, you might end up becoming really comfortable with only a few mechanics per league, but it will be time well spent as you broaden your knowledge of the game. Now one thing I wouldn't worry about as a new player is chasing high-end farming strategies often touted by top-tier streamers and content creators. Most of the time, following these strategies they showcase will require a solid foundation of game knowledge and well-optimized builds to get the results they highlight and trying to follow those strategies when you don't have that foundation will generally just lead to frustration and failure. So learn how to walk before you run and take things slow, focusing on really learning one or maybe a few mechanics at a time. As for what the Atlas League mechanics actually are, most of them start showing up during the campaign at varying stages, and I'll probably do a summary overview with basic tips and tricks for each of them at a later date. But for now just know that all of them can be enjoyable and worth doing if you do them right, but the relative value can vary from league to league based on changes to the game as well as what the general player base is doing. For now though I wouldn't worry so much about profitability of specific league mechanics and would instead focus on what you find enjoyable. I personally like variety and will tend to mix things up from league to league or even within a given league as it keeps me more entertained as compared to just doing the same thing over and over again ad nauseum. And by now you might be wondering, well what's the goal or purpose of the Path of Exile endgame? Well at this point the game is basically a sandbox where you're free to do whatever you want. And you may end up deciding to become an expert at specific league mechanics or maybe you'll focus on farming certain bosses. Some players really like to develop hyper-focused efficient farming methods to acquire vast amounts of currency and then put together ridiculously overpowered builds, while others will use their currency to then craft top-tier items either for sale on the market or for personal use. 
One option I think every player should definitely try at some point, though maybe not too early on or in every league, is completing all of the challenges of a challenge league. In recent years, there have always been 40 challenges per league, with various rewards for completing specific numbers of challenges. Usually these rewards are vanity items such as special cosmetic gear and character effects, as well as a trophy you can display in your hideout. As for the challenges themselves, lots of them you'll naturally complete just by playing the game, while others may require dedicated focus, such as grinding certain types of content, interacting with the new league mechanic, or even defeating endgame bosses under certain specific conditions. Sometimes challenges may require expensive or hard to get items, or a fair bit of luck, and completing all 40 challenges will definitely require a pretty substantial time commitment but I would say should generally be doable over the course of the league, even if you're a pretty casual player. And doing so will definitely expose you to lots of the different types of content that Path of Exile has to offer. But that's all I want to say about the endgame for now. And before I wrap up the video, here's a grab bag of random tips I couldn't figure out where else to put in these guides that I'm sure you'll find helpful. When leveling through the campaign, you rarely ever need to fully explore any given zone, nor do you need to kill every monster in every zone. Killing every monster is actually counterproductive, as it will cause you to outlevel the zone, meaning you'll earn less experience per monster killed. So if you're more than about two levels above the level of the zone, it's probably a good idea to just run past the monsters and move on to the next zone, pausing to maybe kill rare and magic packs and of course bosses. By contrast though, once you're in maps, and especially when you're farming tier 16 maps, you'll generally want to kill every monster you find. There will be a counter in the upper right corner of the map when the minimap is in overlay position that will start to count down once there are less than 50 monsters remaining. But if you get to the end of the map and there's still, say, 20 or less, feel free to move on to the next map rather than wasting time trying to hunt down any stragglers. Much like you don't need to fully explore every zone in the campaign, you also don't need to find all the waypoints along the way, as the vast majority of them you'll never actually end up using again. If you see one, go ahead and grab it, but I generally wouldn't go out of my way to find a waypoint if I've already found the door to the next zone, unless it's a zone that I know I'll be coming back to later, such as when the paths branch in more than one direction, or I need to log off from the game. In Act 2, you'll meet a trio of bandits, each of which will give you a specific permanent buff if you help that bandit by killing the other two. Alternatively, and generally the best option, is to just kill all three bandits, because if you do, Aramir, back in town, will reward you with two passive skill points, which is generally more valuable than whatever perks the bandits themselves would have given you. And if you accidentally click the Help button or later want to change your choice, there is a vendor recipe that will allow you to change your selection. Just search for the Deal with the Bandits page on the wiki for details on the recipes. Tired of accidentally clicking on a monster and then having your character run up and punch it in the face with the basic attack? Just rebind the left mouse button to be the Move Only action, and you'll find moving your character around to be much more effective. And beyond maybe the first zone or two, you really shouldn't be using the default attack ability anyways. There are also some skills that might feel more intuitive for you if you select the Always Attack Without Moving function. So if a skill feels weird to use, maybe try toggling that option on and off. One of the most important ways to boost your character's strength is to complete the Lord's Labyrinth, which will award you with Ascendancy skill points when first completed on each of its four difficulty levels. In order to attempt the first three levels though, you'll need to find and complete little mini-trials that are scattered throughout the game, needing six for the first level and three each for the second and third. You'll know there is a trial in a given zone when the quest panel on the right side of the screen indicates that there is a trial that needs to be completed. So when you see that green text on the side of the screen, be sure to find the trial before moving on. Note though that you only need to complete these mini-trials on the first character within a given league. Subsequent characters can skip them entirely. The fourth and final Labyrinth level requires a special item that can be found in maps and other endgame league mechanics such as Delve. And finally, the last little mini tip I want to give you is that you shouldn't waste time going out of your way to open chests, smash pots, or open the various mini loot containers scattered throughout the game, except maybe in the first couple of zones when you really just need all the items you can get. Although it is technically possible for all sorts of items to drop from these containers, even into endgame maps, 
the probability of getting something good from them is so astronomically low that you should focus on doing anything else that has better chances of dropping good loot, such as killing more monsters. Efficiency is important in Path of Exile, and going out of your way to smash pots and open random boxes just isn't an efficient use of your time. If there's one right next to you or in line of where you're already going, sure, feel free to pop it open, or don't. But if something really juicy does pop out of a container for you, be sure to let me know that I was wrong down in the comments. And that's it for my Path of Exile guide for total beginners. If you've stuck through all four of these videos, you now have enough knowledge and information to confidently start exploring the world of Rayclast. Whether it's completing the story campaign for the first time, this is it. or launching out into the endgame. Feel free to refer back to these videos as needed to brush up on topics that maybe didn't click for you the first time through, as oftentimes a concept that goes over your head the first time you hear it will make a lot more sense after you've had some more experience playing the game. I've been playing this game off and on for over a decade, and I'm still learning all sorts of new things. If you haven't already, please help me out by hitting that like button, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!